Let's begin with prayer. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate you. We honor you. We thank you. We give you praise. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for your love in our life, loving us so much that you sent your son. We receive forgiveness. We receive your peace. We receive your love and joy today. We call heaven's best into the lives of your people. And Lord, as we move forward into your word, I just pray that your word would bring by the Spirit of God, would enlighten, would direct, would encourage, would strengthen us today. Let the words spoken not be my words, but your words, and we give you praise. And everybody said, amen. amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise one more time. We've been doing this series on Mannequin Challenge, which is, if you've ever, ever seen a Mannequin Challenge on YouTube, that's basically like the video people freeze. The reason we've chosen to do it this way is because life has a way when you're hit with problems to get you to freeze. Not that you don't, that you just stop moving, but you stop growing. You stop progressing. You stop looking for a better tomorrow. How many times in life, and maybe you've been there, I think we've all been there in one season or, or another, where someone's betrayed you or you failed or there's a problem or you've been hurt or you're wounded. And out of that, there's a tendency of shutting down and not going any farther. Think about the strategy of the enemy, John 10, 10, that Jesus said, who's come to steal, kill, and destroy. That if he can get you offended at somebody, if he can get you hurt by somebody, if he can get you disappointed even in yourself, you'll stop trying unless you learn how what the word says about the situation and who you are. And so in this series, we've been talking about how not to let problems of life, pains in life that might come in life. And life isn't constant problems, but you'll have challenges, Jesus said. How not to let those moments become the dictating, defining moment of your future and your destiny. Because of regardless of what people have said to you, regardless of what life's problems have told you about you, regardless of what anything around you tries to define you, we can't allow the world. The Bible says don't be conformed to this world. It's thinking. It's system. But be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We have to allow the word of God to reshape us so we can identify who we are. Otherwise, you can go on into a new relationship but still be stuck in the old one. You can go on at a new job but still be emotionally bruised and wounded and stuck in the old one. You can go on where you stop trusting, stop believing, stop hoping, and you're just now in motion but without any progress. And that's not the desire of your Heavenly Father. He wants you to keep growing. Proverbs 4.18 says, The path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter. Anything and everything I say today, please challenge it with the Word of God. The path that God has for you is for you to keep going from glory to glory. He knows the plans he has for you. He knows, and they are good plans. Your heavenly father is is a good God. He doesn't put problems in your life. He brings the solution. Too many times I get frustrated with what I call religion, and that's man creating rules to get to God. Because when you begin to look at religion and define it in light with the word, it doesn't always match up. You'll hear stuff in religion that God will put cancer on you, or God will take that job, or God wanted that child, and so he, he killed them to bring them in heaven. And those are lies of the enemy. Why? Because if you can get wounded at God, you won't be open to God. If you get hurt at God and say, God, why did you do that to me? And I'll never forgive you. And there's people walking around, and maybe even some listening right now, that you have been offended at God because someone told you that the pain that you experienced came from the hand of your heavenly father. And when you approach these things in life, it's the enemy's tactic to get you to close down towards your heavenly father so then you can never receive from him. Because if you think he's going to hurt you, then you don't want to be open to anybody who's open to hurting you. And that's not the desire of the father. Jesus was the expressed image of the father. And Acts 10, 38 says that he went around doing good, healing, and delivering people, and destroying the power of the enemy that was trying to steal their life. Jesus is good. He's the expressed image of the Father. And when they approached Jesus one day and said, good master, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? He stopped them and said, wait a minute, there's none good but one, and that's your heavenly Father. He was saying, even all the stuff I'm doing, it's really all about the Father. Because I am an expressed image. I'm a reflection. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And what we have to realize is that God does not put pain into your life. God brings the source, the solution, the victory. All thanks be to God who gives you victory, triumph in every situation. 
We are, to, we are to respond to God, not like you did this to me, trying to get me to jump through hoops. No, that doesn't give glory to your father. Some people say, oh, if you suffer, that's giving glory. Poverty gives glory to God. Poverty doesn't give glory to God. Poverty limits you from being and having and doing what you can have that God's provided for you and from you doing what God wants you to do. If you don't have any extra money, you can't feed the poor. If you don't have any extra money, you can't help build churches. If you don't have, do you see the key here? If the devil can get people to think that lack is spiritual, then when you're in lack, even when you have the right desire, you don't have the ability to do it. Because you can't give what you don't have. But I'm here to tell you that lack is not the plan of your father. Poverty is not the plan of God. Sickness is not the plan of God. Brokenness is not the plan of God. Pain is not the plan of your heavenly father. And if you're in those situations and seasons, don't feel bad. You're not a bad person. You're a real person going through real life. And until you hear the truth of the word, you're not aware that that's not the plan of your father, that he has good plans for you. Can I get a better amen than that? Say, my heavenly father loves me and has only good for me. See, Gospel John chapter 15, verse 7, 8, and 16 says, what gives glory to your heavenly Father is that you produce much fruit. That's the results, Matthew 13, of the seed of God's word planted into your life, and you producing fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. When you talk about that, most people think that's referring to money, and money is a small part of it, but that's not the completion of it. What it is is the word of God coming into your life and bringing a change in your life in a way that not only you feel it emotionally, but way beyond that, where you experience the reality, but even beyond that, where the sinner notices it practically. See, when, when God is doing something in your life, it can be a way where the doctor who's an atheist that don't believe in miracles or God looks at the x-rays and says, I don't know how to explain this. When it's, when it's God doing it, it could be a banker saying, I don't know how I've been trying to monitor your account, but something's changed. When your neighbor who don't like you and has been talking about you can't deny what God's doing in your life, that's the fruit we're talking about. We can't be, church, we will not be a church of people where we come in and celebrate what God can do but never experience it. That's like going to a restaurant excited about what's on the menu but you never eat it. And the Bible says, and David said it in Psalms, that you have prepared a table before me even in the midst of my enemies. I'm telling you what God has provided for you. He's prepared for you and it's waiting for you. But if all you do is live looking at the menu, you'll never have it because that's not what he wanted you to do and stay at. He wants you to begin to enjoy everything he's provided for you. He wants you to break through that barrier that has confined you and conformed you and become transformed where you can break through and begin to live your life at a level that you didn't think was ever possible. That just can't be hype. But that's the reality of where you're at in life that you're able to move beyond that and live at a level beyond your best. They said in the Old Testament when God... Uh, did a miracle for Israel, it was like heaven on earth. Some people think living for Jesus means it's hell on earth. No, no, it should be heaven on earth. Jesus prayed, thy kingdom come, or told them to pray, excuse me, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If there's not sickness in heaven, then we should be able to fight any sickness on earth. If there's not poverty in heaven, then we should not settle for poverty in our earth life situation. If, there, if there's not torment or oppression or depression in heaven, then you don't have to rest with oppression and depression and settle for that in your life and think, this is the best it's going to be. I guess I'll never have any more. I guess God does it. He's doing it for others. I guess he won't do it for me. No, that's a lie of the devil. And the, listen, the devil is a liar. Jesus said he is the father of all lies and there is no truth in him. He's a deceiver and he has a tactic that he has used for thousands of years to deceive Deceive mankind, and if you fell for it, don't feel, feel bad. A lot of people fell for his deception, but you don't have to stay there. The power of deception is that you're not aware that you've been deceived. What do you need? You might be walking through a room in darkness and not realize it's dark. Have you ever been in a room and it wasn't totally dark, but it was just not bright? 
and you're walking around thinking, oh, it's enough light, and it dawns on you, why don't you turn the light on because what you're looking for, you can't find it because you can't find it because you can't see it and you can't see it because it's not bright enough. Some of you done it. Some of you done it just this weekend. You're looking for those shoes, ladies, and say, I got to get ready. You can't find those shoes. All of a sudden, you're like, what's the problem? You're rumbling through because you need better light. And when you get better light, then it's obvious where it is. What am I telling you? The entrance of his word gives light. And if you don't see it right now, that's okay. Keep digging into the word because his word, once it gives you the light, you can see it. It becomes obvious. One of the things that needs to become obvious as we pick up into the scripture, if you have your Bibles, you can look to Gospel of Luke chapter 15. In here is a story. We know it as the prodigal son. One translation, and he calls it the lost son. It's about a father who had two sons. And the father, notice, we, we understand the context of it's someone who rebels against God, if you've been in church, right? But what we have to understand is, let's back up a little bit. It's about a father who has more than enough. And it's about a father who has more than enough and is very generous, Right there, that's another example of the goodness of your heavenly father. Don't put the scripture up yet. People start reading it without looking at me. So we moved them to the side, so I know if you're looking, staying with me. So here is the story. The father has two sons, and one decides, I don't want to do this life anymore. And he asks for his inheritance, and the father gives it to him. And he leaves the house of the father. And he goes away, and he just, he parties, he sins, he blows his money. And the Bible says when he ran out of money, all of a sudden he ran out of his so-called friends. When he ran out of friends, he ran out of opportunity. And they found himself hungry. And the only thing he'd do is he found a job feeding pigs. Which is interesting because that would be a horrible job for anybody. But you've got to understand, to a Jewish person who considered the pig unclean and could not touch it or eat it, he found himself feeding what one time he would not even touch. As we pick up in this verse now, we can throw it on the screen. There you go. It says verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I want to keep that verse on the screen if we can for a little bit. Notice, what did he do? He came to himself. Say, he came came to to himself. Now, some translations read it that he came to his senses. But I'm going to go a little deeper than that. I believe it's more than he came to his senses. He came to himself. He came to himself. He was reminded of who he was. He came to himself. What was he doing? He woke up to the reality, wait a minute, my father has plenty. My father's employees have plenty and left over. Why am I sitting here? Why am I sitting here? Why am I sitting here? For you to come to the next level of your life, you have to come to yourself. You have to be awakened to your identity on who you are in Christ. As long as you see yourself as poor, trying to get money from God, you'll not have the success you need. Why? Because you get a revelation of how blessed your father is, how generous your father is, and out of that, notice he didn't say, I have a lot. He says, my father has a lot. He became became dissatisfied with his situation because of his connection to his father. Let me say that again. He became dissatisfied with his situation because of his connection with his father. He didn't say, I have a lot. He said, my father has a lot. He, he was, became reminded on who his father is. And because he said, wait a minute, my father's generous. He also, it's inferred, I have a connection to that. 
See, your heavenly father is generous. Your heavenly father is, is not only generous, he's kind. Your heavenly father is not only kind, he's healing. All right, let me go a little deeper. I know it's early, 8.30 service, but can we go a little deeper? What you have to understand is God does not give what he has. So if God gave you healing, if God gave you a financial blessing, he doesn't take out of a basket blessing and hand it to you. Get this middle picture. God does not give you what he has. Stay with me. God gives you what he is. The Bible says he gives of himself. So he doesn't sin love. He is love. And when you receive love, you're receiving him and the nature of love within him. So when you receive love, you receive the nature of God. Connected is God because you can't separate who he is. And so he wanted, he wanted the Old Testament Israel to know who he is. And so he began to give them names to identify because he is so faceted, you could say, so dimensionally deep that you cannot comprehend him in a natural setting with one description. It would like, it, it, for those who have been married for a long time, it would it'd be the one word that describes the essence of your spouse. You can't do that if you know them well. And the nature of God is so amazing. Can I go a little deeper? Yes. Those who like sci-fi stuff. I love this. We live in a three-dimensional world. Length, width, height. If you add time to it, we live in four dimensions. Everything we understand, everything we define, everything we look at, we, we do it within the filters of our four dimensions. What you've experienced in the past, so you've got the time frame, current and future. What you see in the natural. Scripturally, God operates in many, many, many more dimensions than four. The Bible's the only book written about God of all religions of the earth, Christianity, Judaism is the only book, the Bible is the only book that refers to God in dimensions that we do not understand naturally we take by faith. Let, let me give you an example. So, some of you are like, I don't get it. Stay with me. Have you ever heard that God has no beginning and no end? He's always existed. That's a dimension of eternity. Okay? You don't comprehend that. Oh, yeah, I do. He's never had a beginning. No, you don't comprehend it with your natural mind. You actually have been around it enough to, that you are comfortable with it, but the revelation of it is beyond your natural capability to understand it. Because you say, well, what about a billion years? He was still there. Two billion. What about that? It, it, it's beyond. Never having a beginning, never having an end. You can't comprehend it. God has the ability to not only talk to every person. He can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with every person alive simultaneously without ever being distracted by the other conversation. You don't comprehend that. We take it by faith. To the point that he not only knows. The Bible says he knows what you're thinking. He knows your heart. He's even numbered the hairs of your head. That doesn't mean counted. That means numbered. So if you actually pulled one out, it wasn't just one less. It might have been number 365. Yeah. He's numbered. We don't understand that comprehension. We receive it by faith. And so what you understand is God is so vast that he tries to break it down to the levels we understand. And he begins to say, here's this name. Here's Jehovah Jireh. I'm the God who's provide. I'm Jehovah Rophi, Jehovah Shema, Jehovah. And he goes through all these different names, which are trying to help us understand a characteristic of his goodness. Because if you could examine God like you would examine something in a laboratory, focus nonstop, you could go a million years and still never come to the end of discovering new things about the awesomeness of your God. And some of us think we know God because you went to Sunday school when you were a kid and you read a few stories and you think you understand God. You don't understand God. You could be married 45 years and not even understand your spouse. How much more God? He is so vast and so amazing and so deep. That's why uh, the psalmist says, the name of the Lord. 
is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they are safe what is the name the name is the characteristic of god and when god begins to reveal himself he's showing part of his characteristic i'm generous i'm love i'm powerful and when you understand that you don't receive something from god you receive god we're way out of time Maybe I'll stop here and continue the second. You'll just have to get a CD. I don't know. But I, I'm just here to tell you that you don't receive peace from God like he's taking it off the shelf. When you receive peace from God, you are receiving the peace of God. He's connected to that. You don't walk away and say, see you later till I have. No, no, no. You, it's Connection. It's a connection. And when you understand who he is, and because of your covenant, because of the blood of Jesus, just like the prodigal son, he became aware, he was reminded, he came to himself. That that's my father. And if my father has it, I have it. That was the, that was the revelation that the other brother didn't get, right? And the father said, son, everything I have belongs to you. The one that went away understood it, but he didn't understand the relationship, but he understood the connection. My father has it, I have it. Say with me, if my father has it, I have it. Say, if my father has it, I have it. See, if I can get you to the point of, instead of trying to get stuff from God, get to know him, and when you get to know him, you receive it, because when you receive him, you receive all that he has for you, and you begin to come to yourself. Quit saying you're poor. That's a slap in the face of God. You ought to say, I am wealthy. Because of his, your connection to him. You say, but that's not what my bank account chain says. Your bank account changes every day. You know it does. Just when the one day you went to the ATM to find out how much money you thought you had, and it said X amount of dollars, you're like, ooh, that's more than I thought. God bless me. And you went shopping and spent it, only to find out your friend said, oh, by the way, I've been holding that check for two weeks. You can't trust your bank account to define for you who you are. When you get a revelation of the blessing of God and who he is and your connection, you'll be aware. Are you listening? If you want to do it by faith, if you want to do it God's way, you have to begin to see yourself out of the revelation that you're blessed because of your connection to him before you will see the blessing connection to your account. If you want to see the healing power of God, you have to get the understanding of who he is as a healer and begin to get the revelation that you are healed. You are the healed of the Lord before you begin to see it materialize in the natural world. What is happening? You are coming, you're becoming aware of who you are in Christ. And when you become aware of who you are in Christ, it will create a desire within you to push beyond the boundaries around you to break into that which already 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 belongs to you by covenant when a little chicken is in the egg it could try to stay there but something on the inside instinctively tells it that the parameters of my surroundings cannot define my future i have to be willing to break it through so i can experience what's available to me it's instinctive for the chicken, but it will be instinctive to your spirit. When you get a revelation of who you are, you'll begin to see opportunities differently. You'll begin to see life differently. You'll begin to see how you handle time and people differently. Because instinctively by the spirit of God, he is revealing to you the seed and nature of who you are in Christ. And all of a sudden, you'll have this dissatisfaction. The Wait a minute. I don't have to, just like the prodigal son sitting there, I don't have to stay here. I don't have to stay here. This is not me. This is a situation I'm in, but this is not me. This is a problem I'm dealing with, but this is not my identity. My identity is not found by my surroundings. It's found by the truth of his word, connected to the Father. And when he did, he said, I'm going to rise up and go. Isaiah 60 verse 1 says, arise, shine, for your light has come. I'm telling you, if you're comfortable with your surroundings, you'll never push through to the next level. You know what a lot of people do? They want it, 
Jesus, give it to me. But they will never break through the barriers the enemy set up. Oh, but I really want it. Do you really? It's like someone saying, I want to be a piano player. Do you really? Yeah, I really, I really, I really want to be a piano player. When's the last time you've practiced? Oh, I don't practice. I don't got time to do that. You know what they're saying? They really don't want to. Because the proof of desire is in the pursuit. See, when you get, it's not a something I'm just trying to get. When you get I, the identification of who you are from this word, lightens it. you can say, wait a minute. I know I've been living this level for a long time, but I don't have to stay. I know I've been offended at everybody for a long time. I know I've been bitter for a long time. I know I've been hurt for a long time. I know I've been struggling in this area for a long time. But wait a minute. I don't have to stay here. I know I've been under this addiction or control. But that's not me. I don't have to stay here. Am I talking to somebody? Am I talking to somebody? Say, I don't have to stay here. Come on, shout, I don't have to stay here. And where you're staying, where you're at might not even be a bad place, but if it's not the God place, there's still plenty more for in store for you. And you gotta get where you're just so you know, why do some people just stay at a level? Because they get comfortable at the level they're in. But you gotta get to the place. People don't change unless the, the risk. It's too painful or the reward is too great. I mean, you know, I can't eat healthy until the doctor says, you're going to die in three months if you don't stop eating that. Oh, it's amazing how that motivates you. <laughs> right? But this is not, but God doesn't work that way. It's not avoiding pain. It's missing the opportunity. He still loves you. You'll still go to heaven. But the question is, do you want all that God has for you? And if you do, you don't have to let the barrier be your defining mark of who you are. You come to yourself and say, wait a minute, there is more. And begin to move forward, breaking through that barrier. But I'm scared it's new. I know that it's, that's normal for everybody, but you can do it because of who he is and who you are. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We're done. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> you be so gracious and kind to bow your head and close your eyes. If you're here today and do not have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, in a way that you know for sure that he's real and your Lord and Savior. You can. Or maybe you're here and you've allowed stuff to come between you and God and you know your heart's not right. And you say, I need to get my life straightened out. Either way, let's pray this prayer together. Let this prayer come from your heart. Romans says, it's with the heart man believes in the righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So let's pray this prayer with me, but let it come from your heart. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I repent of all my sins. I turn to you today. I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he came to this earth in the flesh, died on a cross for my sins, was buried for me, and on the third day rose again for me. Because I believe that, I turn to you, Jesus. I repent of all my sins. I believe in my heart, and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he, came, that he died on the cross for me, was buried for me, and on the third day rose again for me. I receive that now. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise.